in today's event. We are so excited to have you here uh, today. And congratulations on your admission to the Faculty of Information. We're very excited to be able to welcome you to the iSchool, um, not only today, but also um, in September as well. Um, so just a few housekeeping items before we do get started with today's program. Um, the session is being recorded. So um, we will be sharing the recording with you afterwards. We're going to be sharing um, a bunch of resources with you as well. And all of that information you're going to be able to find through the Graduate Admissions Hub. So hopefully you've all visited the Graduate Admissions Hub um, already, but we do have a lot of resources available for you there to help prepare you for the start of uh, classes um, in September. Um, and so included in the Graduate Admissions Hub will have um, past recordings from um, our meet and greet event in case you've uh, missed it, our meet, uh, meet our advisors event, um, as well as this getting started event as well. So the guide will be there as well as the recording from this event will be there. Um, I ask that you please save your questions until the Q&A period at the end. Um, after the formal presentation, just because there's so many people logged in today, um, it may get a little um, confusing with all of the, the chats coming in um, at once. So please save your questions to the end, as your question may also be answered throughout the presentation as well. And the way that you can ask questions is through the chat feature, and you can direct those questions either to myself or to our other co-host, Nicole Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Um, and we will moderate those questions and pass it along to the presenters at that time. Um, also, uh, closed captioning is enabled, so you can um, click on the CC if you want to um, enable the closed captioning for, for this event as well. All right, and I want to start off um, with an acknowledgement of the traditional land. So we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Lendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So I'm going to get Josh to start the recording if he hasn't already. Oh, yeah, I think he started already. Great, perfect. Okay, so without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce you to our most wonderful Dean, uh, Dean Wendy Duff, um, who is going to uh, start off with a few words. I realize I have the same sweater on <laughs> when you brought up that picture. Anyway, um, it is my great, great pleasure to welcome you today, um, both to this session and to the faculty. I know I'm a little biased, uh, but I think we have the most interesting and amazing faculty at certainly the top research institution in, the can in my country and I in Canada, and I believe it's a pretty amazing country. I was thinking this morning, you know, about this particular group and this particular get started day, because when you join the school, you will come in September and it will be the 40th anniversary of when I went to grad school for the first time. And so I was thinking about the similarity and differences about when I went to grad school and, and your experience will be like many of you. I was a first generation. Um, no other member of my family had gone to grad school, uh, though now actually my kids have. So that has changed. But and, and because of that, like some of you, perhaps, I was so excited about what this experience was going to bring and the opportunities it would afford me. But at the same time, I was scared and I wondered whether or not I would fit in. So, you know, I, like some of you, actually during my degree, learned to program, though never that super well, my brother tells me who's, he's a computer programmer, but it did prepare me in my courses, in the classes I took, in the practicum, in my summer job. During that time, I gained the experience, the expertise, the knowledge that I needed to have what has been the most amazing career that I think anyone could have. I worked in libraries because of my degree. I worked in archives because of my degree. I did research with electronic records. 
I did research on museums and it was my grad degree that I believe prepare me for that. But you know, the other things that I hope that I experience that you also will is I met lifelong friends and it was those collaborators, those people that I worked with projects. Now, of course, I met them the first time face to face, which, and we were all in the same country and all in the same room, uh, which of course is so different than today. Um, I also had a set of profs that challenged me to think in a different way, that taught me many things, they wrote me a reference, and they were there to support me along the various stages of my time. And again, I can only hope that you too will have a very similar experience. You know, I was thinking about that programming course that I took 40 years ago, and you know, it was so long ago, and one of the things that were different is I actually had to program using punch cards. And I programmed on a mainframe. And when I figured out my coding, I did it on a piece of paper first. So, you know, <laughs> fast forward, we're all of you, here we are all joining together on our own laptops, computers, phones, and what a different world it is. However, what I hope is that you will have what I had, and that is an enriching, wonderful experience that again, challenged me, that taught me things and prepared me for a career in which no matter what I've done, I have never been bored. I have been challenged. I've had lots of wonderful collaborators along the way. And again, I hope each and every single one of you have something similar and that through this degree, you also will start what is an incredible, exciting career that will keep you going for 40 years plus. So it is getting started and you've heard enough about me. Uh, I hope that through your two years, I will actually get to meet you. There's 167 people on this call um, face to face and we'll be in the school and we'll be in our wonderful Bissell building. The picture that um, that's taken in is our fourth floor, what we call the Inforum, though I think we should rename it. And it is a place where we often gather and get to know each other and work hard into the night and collaborate and all those wonderful things. So, but again, I know that you're ready to start your exciting adventure and stop hearing about mine. And so I'm gonna hand it back to Andrea. But again, welcome. And I so look forward to meeting you in person, hearing about your experiences and um, watching you develop and launch your career. Thank you very much, Dean Duff. That was, those are very encouraging words and a great way to get uh, the event started today. Um, so without further ado, we will do that. Um, okay, and we are gonna start off, actually, you know what, I'm gonna go back to the agenda. Um, so we are going to um, have a little introduction on what is ACORN. So if it's the first time you're ever hearing of it, you're going to hear um, a little bit about um, how to access ACORN, um, course enrollment, uh, money matters, accessibility services, your T card. We're going to learn about collaborative specializations, the information hub, uh, hear from some of our peer mentors, or some of your peer mentors, um, and talk a little bit about um, upcoming events as well. So I'm going to pass it along to uh, Christine Chan, and she is our Assistant Registrar of Records and Awards, and she's going to introduce you to all that is ACORN. Hello. Can you all hear me? Nice to meet you virtually. Um, apologize for any background noise ahead of time. I'm Christine, and I'm here to give a quick overview of ACORN. You may have already logged in already, and if not, I encourage you to do so and get comfortable using it before the day of enrollment. To log into ACORN or Quirkus and pretty much any platform at U of T now, you use your UTOR ID or join ID if not authenticated yet. Andrea will have sent emails with links about how to update your UTOR ID from your join ID and check back to those emails if needed, or just email us and let us know if you have any questions on how to do this. ACORN is more the admin side of things. Quirkus is the platform where 
courses are administered and delivered and where you'll find the current course syllabi when they're released by the instructors. During the pandemic, Quirkus has also been the platform on which a lot of courses were held online. Uh, the next slide, this shows the login page of ACORN. So you'll log in using the button on the left side of the page. And then on the next couple of slides, you'll see the dashboard that provides an overview of everything that can be updated on ACORN. To start, you can check your name, your address, email, emergency contacts in the system. So please keep these fields especially updated and current. Um, be sure especially to add someone that we can contact if, knock on wood, anything happens. Um, other uses for ACORN include checking your timetable, which we'll get into further later, but please note that your personal timetable is different than the main official timetable. And um, in case you're wondering, the fall 2021, winter 2022 timetables will be posted mid-July, so coming soon to give you time to prepare, review, and plan out your schedules before course enrollment starts on August 5th. Um, so also you can check your official academic records on ACORN, AKA grades. So the grades that you'll see posted on Quirkus are considered unofficial. ACORN is where it is official. And you can also defer payments if you're taking out OSAP or government loans. You can also switch your concentration yourself. You can order transcripts for things like award applications um, and then Hopefully when you win the said award, you can set up direct deposit. Um, when the time comes, things like tax forms can be printed there as well. Um, one note, going back to your name, when, we, when you're checking your name, if you want to officially change your name or gender on ACORN, you will need to fill out what is called an SGS name and gender change form that's online and you'll need to upload one piece of government ID or documentation. So usually under normal circumstances, you'd be asked to upload a notarized copy of this legal document or present the original in person at SGS. Um, but due to COVID, the, most offices are closed. And so they're elect, uh, taking electronic copies that have not been notarized. Um, they're doing this by um, that online form. Um, so, and then a more simpler version to have a preferred name appear on class lists, but not to change it legally in Rosie or anything in Acorn, sorry. Um, you may just quickly add your preferred name and this will show up in class lists without the whole official change process. Um, okay, so to search for courses on ACORN, you can just start typing in the course code and it'll provide a drop down list. Um, quick note, just make sure that you're checking, like choosing the right term of the course because they might all show up. Um, in U of T language, they, they use the word session instead of term sometimes. So always please cross check, like I said, our posted timetable um, for the final official times, dates, and delivery method. Um, they should reflect back to each other, your personal timetable versus the official, but always go by our official posted timetable. Um, so the next slide should show the enrollment cart. This is what it looks like. So you can add courses to the cart, just like online shopping, which we've all sort of gotten used to, um, but please be sure to wake up for 6 a.m. on August 5th, Toronto time, to click the little enroll button to add all your courses at that time. Um, as a quick cross check, once you've clicked enroll, uh, we suggest you go back to that academic history page that we showed you earlier. And that page is real time, immediate time. So if you've fully added the course, it'll show up on your academic history transcript right away. If you don't see it there, then please come back to this enrollment cart and click enroll and make sure you've added the course. If you've been waitlisted for a course, you'll be able to see that waitlisted status, um, the number you're on the waitlist. If it's a required course that you're waitlisted for, please don't panic, just stay on the waitlist. Courses are reviewed very often. 
um, but we do need to see the numbers, okay? So just stay on the wait list. Uh, there is quite a bit of movement. So if people drop, you might get naturally slotted in by the system. Um, please note also though, if it's not a required course, if it's more an elective course that you're waitlisted for, then you might need to be prepared to choose another elective this year. Uh, but don't worry, next year, you guys will get first dibs as upper year, second year students. Um, and so the next uh, slide, there might be a help. Yes, this is the step-by-step -step how to guide um, to, on how to use ACORN. It's very useful, very comprehensive with lots of screenshots and sometimes short video clips embedded. So this is in, accessible from the login page of ACORN. So hopefully this can help and that's it. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Christina. It was very helpful. Um, we also provided, um, so as Christina was talking, she um, mentioned um, a few things about name changes and quiz timetables. So all those links we've posted in the chat for you as well to refer back to. Okay, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Sherry. She's our Associate Registrar of Student Services and Admissions um, to go through course enrollment with you. Yeah. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, all the different time zones you guys are logging in from. Um, as, uh, as Andrea mentioned, my name is Sherry. I'm the Associate Registrar. Uh, that doesn't really mean anything to all you guys. Um, I'm one of the, in practical terms, I'm one of the MI MMST advisors. Um, and I also talk to students with regards to uh, financial aid, um, awards, scholarships, etc. So today we're going into and talk a little bit more about course enrollment, um, how fall term course delivery might look like, um, the timeline to enroll and to get registered. Enrollment does not mean getting registered. So we'll explain that in a bit, um, as well as some uh, money matters to take note of. All right, so jumping right into our next slide. Thank you. Okay, so this is kind of a, we kind of um, uh, divided the different steps into how uh, students should think about the courses they and want to enroll into um, and uh, leading them all the way, leading you guys all the way to August 5th. First and foremost, of course, is review our getting started guide uh, for those that is coming to us from outside of U of T undergraduate programs, uh, please do take a look at how to understand our University of Toronto course codes. Um, of course, get to know your degree requirements. Um, our MI students complete eight credits. Uh, MMST students complete 7.5 credits. And CDP students, uh, our combined MI and MMST, you'll be completing 13 credits. And then we get on to our next step on the next slide. Um, uh, understand what your required courses are, right? Uh, all our MI, MMST and CDP students, regardless of the pathway that you guys follow, um, you will be taking required courses. For instance, all our MI students will be taking uh, something called INF 1005 and INF 1006, regardless of concentration, regardless of whether or not you're completing thesis or just co-op, or if you're completing two concentrations, right? So you will always complete one set, one pair of INF 1005 and INF 1006. For students thinking about thesis, you will want to take a look at enrolling into our research methods course, INF 1240, in your year one, it's a prerequisite for any student that is thinking about a thesis. And just largely, what are the courses I definitely need to complete in year one, right? Depending on the pathway you want to follow. Yeah. Now let's take a look at electives, our next step. Um, electives, most of our electives does not have prerequisites, but some of them do. So taking a look at our courses page on our website, identify what might the prerequisites be of the electives you want to take. 
uh, for instance, our MMST students that are thinking about taking the MMST internship, please do remember that it is a prerequisite for the MMST internship uh, for you to have completed MSL 3900 in year one fall semester. MI students thinking about co-op, you want to enroll in INF 3900 as an elective in year one. Some things to think about. And as you're planning out your courses, um, of course, remembering uh, the number of courses you're actually eligible to enroll into. Full-time students take 2.0 credits per semester. Part-time students take 1.0 credits per semester. And of course, as uh, Christine mentioned previously, uh, enrollment for our incoming students start bright and early, August 5th, 6 a.m. Toronto time. You snooze, you lose, really. Wake up at 6 a.m. Um, and you want to be enrolling in both fall and winter term courses. Uh, we have one enrollment start date for both uh, fall and winter courses. And it's not that you, you don't have to wait to enroll into winter term. So all that to say, we prepared two slides um, to kind of just remind you of some of the important things. Um, and um, uh, we kind of develop a three step um, on how you should be thinking about course selections. Um, you want to be taking a look at your core and required courses first. Um, obviously schedule your courses that there's no conflict on the timetable. Um, and then you want to start thinking about and slotting in electives or recommended electives based on the concentration um, that you might be thinking about for MI students and for MMST students about the areas of museum studies that you want to concentrate in. Okay, and last but not least, in terms of courses, um, for our MI students, we just like to mention, specifically mention that it is a maximum of two concentrations allowed. Um, I know we have so many wonderful courses, so many interesting concentrations, um, and you probably want to take it all. Uh, not quite possible. Uh, there is a limit of 8.0 credits uh, for our MI students, 7.5 for our MMST. Um, and for our MI students, you're only eligible to take up to two. Um, a lot of feedback, a lot of feedback that we do receive from students, and you might hear it from the student panel, is oftentimes you might start off. I apologize for the little yakking at the background. My little one is right beside me. Um, um, you might want, you might be starting off thinking, oh my God, there's two concentrations I definitely want to take. Um, but a lot of students come in and they realize the, 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 the variety of electives uh, that you're able to take. So um, many of our students don't end up completing two concentrations because that means completing two sets of required courses um, and to allow for flexibility in your scheduling they often end up taking only one set of required courses and a plethora of um, electives to kind of supplement uh, the competencies that they want to graduate with. Okay, so next we're going to talk just a little bit about fall term course delivery. Our fall term course delivery is you will you're going to see both in person and online components. Okay. Um, in person, what it means when we say in person, in person could mean a fully in person delivery. Lectures are in person or um, tutorials are in person. It could also mean that it is a fully in person course whereby there is a very small parallel running online section as well. Or it could be an online lecture but tutorials are delivered in person. Or that it could be an online lecture and tutorials are offered as both online and or in person. And what the instructors are often, um, uh, what the instructors might do is to kind of rotate the students in the tutorials through in person, through online for different weeks so that um, every student will be able to get the in-person experience. Um, some of the courses can be delivered online, 
fully online. The lectures are online. The tutorials might be online as well, um, but there will also be in-person drop-in sessions uh, that students could gather to discuss, um, to work on projects together, etc. Um, so uh, even for our fully online courses uh, for the fall semester, a very small handful of which um, there will be some in-person drop-in sessions that students Hi. can be present for. Hi. Um, remote learning experience. Uh, we kind of put this together uh, last year when uh, we are go when we know that we're going to be delivering a full year of online curriculum. Um, so minimum technical requirements, some things to consider for security. Um, and um, equipment availability. Um, obviously, for it, when it comes to equipment, it is best practice to purchase your own. However, if you were to run in any issues with your equipment um, and you really um, need something to work on in a pinch, um, for our MI and MMST students, you are eligible to borrow um, the various equipments that we are able to loan students. Uh, there's laptops, there's iPads, there's tablets, um, there's video cameras, there's cameras, various items that students could borrow from, um, uh, from us. All right. Ah, as mentioned, enrollment. Uh, um, I think I might have moved. Okay, well, we're going to talk about my... Thanks, Andrea. Uh, sorry, just quickly about enrollment and registration. We kind of chatted about it previously already. Um, enrollment is where you enroll into courses on ACORN, August 5th, 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's the start date. Registration doesn't mean enrollment. Enrollment doesn't mean registration. Registration is the action of deferring or paying fees. It is the signal to the university uh, it is the signal to the university that you are ready to be on campus. You're ready to be to start taking fall term courses. Um, our recommended date to pay or defer your tuition fees is August 27th. It's not the deadline to receive. Uh, it's the recommended date to pay so that your, uh, your bank and the university has enough time to process your payment and have it recorded into the system prior to September 10th um, beyond Beyond which, um, if you haven't, uh, if the university haven't received your payment or deferred your fees, then students do run the risk of having all their courses being removed. Because it's kind of signaling to the university that you don't intend to be here for the fall term. Um, so we uh, just want to make sure that our students are clear on the enrollment and registration piece. And of course, to clarify, uh, course enrollment does happen before registration. Okay. All right, money matters, something everybody is concerned about. Um, what this slide shows is um, top left-hand corner is where your expenses are, Hi. your major expenses, right? Tuition, Hi. living expenses, something for you guys to consider for you to budget. Um, for each academic year, um, our domestic students pay approximately $24,000. Um, uh, sorry, for our domestic students, each academic year is approximately $12,000. Uh, for our international students, approximately $40,000, plus living expenses. So ways to support your education. For our domestic students, you can apply for OSAP. Uh, you can apply for out of province government student loans. Um, this form the basis of your financial, a lot of your financial assistance in funding the program. Uh, we are a professional master's degree. Uh, this means that our program does not provide stipend, uh, unlike research stream uh, graduate programs. Um, so the funding does have to come, the funding uh, of their education does need to come from uh, loans, uh, from part-time work, um, from savings, uh, for, or from awards that, you are, um, that you might be receiving. Okay, so going back to OSAP, OSAP, and uh, for our domestic students, OSAP out of province government student loans from the basis of uh, financial aid for our domestic students. And if you're in receipt of government student loans, 
um, then you are eligible to be considered for something called the PMFA, the top right hand corner box. PMFA or the master's, uh, the professional master's financial assistance. Um, it is something that is offered through the faculty. Um, and it is, um, so for instance, for students that are receiving OSAD, uh, we receive your financial need information centrally from our OSAP office and the PMFA is going to help with a portion of your unmet financial need and this is automatically considered no no forms needed or anything like that we receive the information centrally from our OSAP office and we typically disperse uh, the amount to students uh, around late October, early November, depending on when we receive the information. For our students that receive out of province government student loans, there is a short form that you will have to complete just because we don't receive your financial aid information centrally. Uh, so do, do remember out of our out of province student loan students, please do remember to complete that form. It's on our website um, so that we can consider you for the PMFA as well. Next is Omnibus. Omnibus is one is our internal uh, faculty scholarship consideration application. Um, it's one big application um, to consider you for anything you might be eligible for. Um, it is competitive. Um, the application will be open from August 1st to September 30th. It's not first come, first serve. So nobody has to rush to complete the form by August 1st. You do have until September 30th to complete it. Um, it asks for information about your extracurricular activities. It asks for um, any interests, various interests that you might have. Um, so keep it on your radar. Between August 1st to September 30th to complete the Omnibus Awards application. Um, for all of our students, as long as you are a registered student at the University of Toronto, you are eligible to apply for something called the work study program. Uh, it's, a, it's basically part time positions available to students all around the campus, uh, the earnings of which obviously can help with uh, some living expenses uh, with some tuition. Um, obviously, your savings uh, might be dipped into to help with the cost of education for the next two to three years. Um, awards, other awards. Um, SGS stands for the School of Graduate Studies. Um, they have and they provide a variety of university awards. Um, we don't collect that information centrally on our website, but it is available on the School of Graduate Studies website under their awards. Uh, what happens is we also receive notification when deadlines are coming up and we include these deadlines and information of these awards in our weekly newsletters uh, that we send to our current students. So always keep an eye out on our weekly newsletters to see if there's anything that you might be eligible to apply for. National Government Awards, uh, some of you might have heard of something called NSERC, SHRC, OGS, CGS. Um, these are big national awards given by the research agencies of Canada, some of which are eligible to our international students as well. Um, and they have a variety of deadlines. Some of their deadlines could be in December. Some of their deadlines could be in January all the way into March. Um, the value of these awards range from 15,000 to 17,500. Um, so for our students here um, on this call that are interested in, re in incorporating research components into their, into their studies, it's definitely something for you to look out for and for you to apply for. Um, and of course, line of credit. We encourage our students to apply for a line of credit if at all possible. Um, it's something that you negotiate directly with your bank. Um, and uh, it's basically a pot of funds that is accessible to you through your bank. Um, if you don't use it, you don't get charged for anything. If you do use it, then of course the bank does start calculating interest from there. Um, we encourage students to think about applying for a line of credit just because it could be uh, some useful, easily accessible uh, emergency funds in your back pocket if needed. 
So this is quite a quick overview. Uh, some of you might have already seen this page on our website. If you haven't, please do take a look. Um, it is basically a comprehensive, on, not quite comprehensive, but a very good summary of the various deadlines when it comes to money matters that our students should be um, having eyeballs on, uh, such as uh, by June or July, please already apply for your uh, government student loan. Um, in August, apply for work study positions, part-time roles, apply for omnibus awards application, remember to pay tuition fees or to defer your tuition fees. Right. So we kind of break it down into the different months uh, for students to take note of as you get through it. So if you haven't already gone to that page, please do. Um, and we have provided links that will direct you to more details as needed. Okay, tuition fees each semester. Um, this section is particularly important to our MI students, Master of Information students, especially those that might be thinking about toggling between full-time and part-time or our part-time students. Um, tuition fees, when we look at, when we, uh, look at tuition fees, tuition fees is actually composed of program fees and campus fees. And campus fees is your mandatory and optional incidental system access and ancillary fees. And why it's important to break the two components down and highlight it to you is because our MI and MMS, uh, MI and MMST students run by a minimum degree fee structure. If we can take a look at our next slide, um, our minimum degree fee uh, for our MI and MMST program is uh, basically four terms of full-time program fees. Right? When we pay tuition fees, we're paying for the program fees and our campus fees. But when we look at the minimum price tag, so to speak, of the MI MMST program, um, the minimum degree fee is only taking into consideration the program fee portion, which means um, for a full-time MI student, um, Andrew, if we could look at our next slide. <laughs> Thank you. So for a full-time student, uh, when we're, for a full-time student that is, that is doing two years of full-time studies, great, it's very straightforward. You look at your invoice, you pay as is, right? And prior to graduation, there will be no balance whatsoever left to pay. For our part-time student, um, our part-time students pay a part-time program fee every semester as well. But by the time you graduate, you wouldn't have quite paid the, uh, the cost of four terms of full-time program fee quite yet. So what will happen is you will have a balance of degree fee. And the balance of degree fee is the difference between four terms of full-time program fees minus all the program fees you have paid prior to graduation. Campus fees is not considered part of the minimum degree fee. So something to remember. So for many of our part-time students, you know, it's quite common that you will complete it between three to four years. Depending how many courses you take each term, depending on how quickly you're completing things. Um, so you will have a small balance of degree fee that you will have to pay out at the end. For our students that are thinking about the possibility of switching between full-time and part-time studies, um, you will also likely have a balance of degree fee as presented in the scenario in the last box. Um, there, um, just because for just because uh, two terms of part-time fees is not quite equivalent to two terms um, of full-time fees. Just a general reminder for our, our MI students, especially since um, it's possible to toggle between full-time and part-time. Uh, a quick look into how to get registered. So previously we chatted about enrolling into courses and then we talked about uh, registering. Registering is the act of paying your minimum tuition fees or deferring your tuition fees. So in order to get registered, you can make minimum tuition uh, minimum tuition payment, which is equivalent to full term tuition fees uh, for students receiving OSAP or um, out of province government student loans, you can defer your payment to a later date and the deferral happens directly on ACORN. 
uh, for students here that are going to be receiving a major award, if you're coming in already holding an OGS or CGS, um, or if you have received a, an admissions fellowship, um, then we will be connecting with you uh, sometime in early August to guide you through in deferring your tuition fees by the use of a form. So you can also defer the payment of your tuition fees to a later date. Okay. And how to make tuition payment? There's a whole variety of different ways. You can pay through a Canadian bank. Um, you can also pay using a credit card, though there is a service charge. Um, you can pay, obviously, using your OSAB and government student loans. Uh, for international students, you can pay through the Western Union Global Pay. And uh, something to highlight as well, if you are big on shopping, if you're big on traveling, do note that you can convert your aeroplane and TD travel reward points into credits to be used towards your paying fees. So all that traveling and uh, shopping points won't go to waste. Okay, finally, my last section is uh, reminding our students to please, uh, to please register uh, for accessibility services. Um, if you um, have any accessibility challenges, um, accessibility services, it, they collaborate with faculty, staff, and students to provide individualized accommodations that meets the needs of registered students while ensuring the academic, academic integrity of the University of Toronto. Right. It is important to us that our students um, with any form of accessibility challenges, long term or short term, are being accommodated so that you are able to complete your complete your courses on equal playing fields. Uh, for students that are in need of accessibility uh, accommodations, uh, we encourage you to get in touch with them prior to July 14th um, so that everything could be in place for you prior to fall term starting. All right, and that's my spiel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be around for FAQs later. And thank you for working with me through a very noisy little one beside me. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Sherry. I'm sorry, there's so many questions coming in right now. So I'm trying to answer as many as possible. Um, again, please save your questions for the Q&A section at the end because it is hard to manage the presentation and answer questions at the same time. So we will get to them, but please save them to the Q&A section at the end. Um, so that is me, Andrea. I'm going to talk very quickly about collaborative specialization. So what is a collaborative specialization? Um, so these are partnerships that we have and collaborations that we have with um, other departments at the University of Toronto. Um, so if there's a specific uh, specialization that you are hoping to uh, maybe take courses in, please note you do have to apply to that specialization separately, um, because again, it is offered through another department at the university. So they are going to have their own set of admission requirements, deadlines, and so on. Um, so as you can see from the chart here, a lot of them um, do have ongoing deadlines. So if at any point during your studies here at the iSchool, um, you can apply for a collaborative specialization. Some of them do have dates, a specific deadline date. So you wanna make sure that you're going on to the specific um, website of the um, collaborative specialization you're interested in to find out what the deadline requirements or deadline dates are, if there are any, and what those requirements are. Sometimes um, it usually is just submitting, you know, an additional statement of intent as to why you're interested in that specialization. Once you graduate, um, you will graduate with your degree in, in MI or MMST, as well as a collaborative specialization in that area um, that you've chosen uh, to pursue. But you do have to be admitted um, to an MI or MMST program before you can apply to a collaborative specialization. Um, it does not add any additional time to your degree, nor does it add any additional cost to your degree. It just means that the courses that you would be taking as your electives would be geared towards that specific specialization. So there are going to be uh, course requirements that you do need to complete in order to fulfill those requirements for that specialization. And those would be done um, through your elective courses, basically. Um, so it's not adding extra time 
for money because again, we don't charge per course. There's just the standard program fee as Sherry already talked about. Um, so so it, it would, wouldn't affect that in that way. Um, so on our website, as well as through the Getting Started Guide, will be more information about, um, about the different specializations that are available, the process of applying to those specializations and so on. All right, your T card. So um, some of you may, as an incoming U of T student, already have a T card. Um, but for those of you who are just new to U of T, um, your T card is, um, is your student identification card, basically. Um, your u ID and password provides you access to online services like your UT um, email address, course content on Quarkus, webinars, library resources, um, and so on, the network services and so on. Um, so in order to get your T-card, so in, before you can set up your uh, U of T email address, you do have to um, get your T-card. Um, and, and obviously not being in person right now, um, you can't do that in person, but you can still do that online. Um, so you can make a virtual appointment with the T-card office on the link provided on the screen there. Um, and once you get um, your um, sort of virtual T card until you arrive on campus and get your physical T card, um, you will be able to set up your U of T email address. And it is really important that you do set up your U of T email address um, because it is the way that we communicate with, with you as well as the university communicates with you. So it's very important that you do set that up as soon as you can um, and, um, and use your U of T email address and check it. Uh, frequently because we will be communicating with you through that uh, email address. Okay, um, so that is my section. Um, I am now going to introduce you to um, Elena, who is the director of the iSchool Learning Hub, to talk a little bit more about um, the, some of those services that are available for you. Thank you, Andrea. Greetings, everyone. My name is Melena Bernstein, and like you, I am absolutely brand new to the iSchool. I began on July 1st. And so um, I look forward to getting to know the iSchool just as you are. I'm going to say just a few general things about the, uh, the Learning Hub and um, our vision for it, as it's something that's developing and growing, but also building from um, a whole range of supports for your learning that have already been in place. So first I wanna say, because this is something that we're really growing and um, envisioning right now, it's important that I hear from you. So as people are thinking about the range of ways in which um, we could better support your learning and support what you're doing in your courses, um, and not just thinking about necessarily things um, that can support your writing and your connections with um, your internships, and all of these other kinds of, of things that we think about with the academic realm, but also think about the range of ways in which we can support um, your wellness and your, your personal growth at the iSchool. Um, so I wanna hear from you as we're continuing to grow the services that we already have. Um, we'll go to the next slide. And so for this, I'm gonna pass, um, the baton to Daisy Dowell, who has been the one um, who's a librarian at the iSchool and also an alum. And she is going to um, tell you in a little bit more detail about some of the specific services that we already have as part of the iSchool. So Daisy, I pass the torch to you. Uh, hello everyone, I hope you can see me. Um, my name is Daisy Dowdall, as Melania said, and I am a librarian at the Faculty of Information. Um, so first, iSkills. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are already very familiar with this program. Um, I see that you've registered in huge numbers for our summer series, which is just delightful for me uh, to see. Um, broadly speaking, our iSkill series offers students the opportunity to develop professional, technical, and academic skills related to information studies. Um, and we work with professors, alumni, industry partners, and you um, really to create uh, unique rosters of workshops 
every term that reflects the in-demand values um, of, the, of the information profession. Uh, so stay tuned with more information about our fall roster. Uh, you can expect an email coming in August with that information. Um, I know you have been registering for our summer series via Eventbrite. I expect we'll be using a, a different platform for the um, fall, so, so just keep that in mind. Um, and thinking about fall, our hope is to offer a mix of in-person and online offerings, but we're still trying to figure it out um, as everyone figures out what fall is going to look like in more detail. Um, moving on to tech loans. Um, oh, and I think in the chat, um, uh, I'll, I'll put the link to um, the iSkills website so, so, so you can um, learn more. Uh, Josh, could, could you help me providing the, the, the links to our students? Um, anyway, so uh, tech loans. Sherry already talked about these a little bit, um, but as a quick refresher, students at the Faculty of Information have access to a wide range of technology through the tech loans program, which is co-run co by Tech Fund, which is a student organization, and the Learning Hub. And we have a wide range of technology from Retina MacBooks to Surface Pros, presentation um, devices, any kind of adapter you could ever think of. I learned so much about adapters when I started working at the iSchool. Um, AV cables, headphones, very fancy cameras and mics. It really runs a gamut. Um, the nice thing about tech loans is that they are only available to our students. And that means that you won't be competing for access to them with the entire university computer, uh, community. Although I will say that during the end of term periods, some technology is um, really in demand. So I recommend coming sooner rather than later to pick up whatever you need. Uh, students typically uh, will pick up software or sorry, hardware from the fourth floor of the um, learning hub. Uh, and you can expect more details about how this will work in the fall, again, as we uh, continue to furnish our reopening plan. Um, next is iRelax. Uh, as Melania said, we really care deeply about uh, student wellness and um, wellness is a central part of the Learning Hub. Um, starting a new program is super exciting, but we know that school can be busy and we want students to feel like the Learning Hub is a place where students can grow in a really holistic way. Uh, iRelax is U of T's first secular, ethically and sustainably sourced mindfulness resource area. That's a lot of words. Um, what it effectively means is that on the fourth floor, we have a lovely little nook where there are physical props, including yoga mats, meditation cushions, benches, um, print resources uh, and um, iPod shuffles um, that you can use for mindfulness meditation uh, practices. Uh, in the past, we've offered uh, scheduled mindfulness meditation sessions through iRelax, and it's my hope that we can continue offering that in the fall. Uh, Robarts Library also has a similar setup um, on the, I believe, seventh floor. Um, and that's called the reflection room. So, you know, if you come to our space and you realize there are no yoga mats, you can always just go next door and use some of theirs. And then my final thing to talk about are the mandatory orientation workshops or modules. All incoming students are expected to complete these um, and they take place on the virtual in forum. Uh, the modules cover topics like academic integrity and citations, uh, library and research skills, um, and introduce students to some of the resources that the iSchool and the university more broadly have available to you. Um, along with these modules, students must complete a short online quiz and pass that quiz called Cite It Right before the end of the first week of classes. And we do review those for completion. Um, you will receive an email in August with more information about this program. Right now, you don't have to worry about it at all. 
Um, so that's it from me. If you have any questions about anything I've mentioned, uh, please feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, Joss has very kindly put my email in the um, chat. So over to the next person. Great, thank you both very much. Um, okay, so we have next, oops. Um, okay, Andrea is here to talk about our uh, peer mentoring program. I believe Andrea is here. I am, I'm here. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Andrea Lida Sevsek, one of the peer mentoring coordinators for the coming academic year, along with Crystal Huang, Hadis Moschi, and Melanie Coleman. And you can find our full profiles on the iSchool's uh, Student Life and Experience webpage. But let's just say, in short, that all of us are upper year Master of Information students, with some of us part-time, most of us in the user experience design concentration with me being the only outlier <laughs> in the knowledge management and information management concentration. Now, I think uh, we have uh, Crystal present. Crystal, if you are able to turn on your camera and just uh, say a quick hi, wave, that'd be great. I think she's here. Um, and Melanie's here as well. Mel, are you able to turn on your camera and just quickly say hi? Maybe later. All right, so <laughs> next slide. Thank you. Um, our job is to support the peer mentoring at iSchool Mandate, which is to help build community within the Faculty of Information by matching any willing incoming students with upper year mentors. And the goal is to support mentees in the transition to the iSchool and graduate school life. Next slide, please. So how, oh, one back. Thank you. So how can you become a mentee, you ask? Well, the first step is to let us know that you would like to be matched with a mentor. And you do this by filling out the Google form we created for this purpose. Uh, you can find links to the form in our Facebook group. You simply search for peer mentoring at iSchool in Facebook. Uh, you will find the link through any of the iSchool newsletters coming up to you. And most conveniently on the iSchool Student Life and Experience webpage. So you find it, you fill it in, you submit it, and that's how you let us know that you would like to have a mentor. Now, the deadline for submitting the form to us is the end of this month. So uh, July 31st, that's a Saturday. We, we put July 30th, the Friday on the form. Don't you worry, it's till the end of really that weekend because um, then during August, we will be working to match you with one or two mentors. And once that is done, we'll introduce you via email first. And then the mentors will take it from there and contact you to set up your first meeting. So we are planning to possibly create a peer mentoring community group apart from the Facebook group that already exists, but that depends on everyone's feedback um, on the Google form. And once we know what platform people prefer, we will set that up and share the information with mentees and mentors at that time. Uh, we're also planning several peer mentoring events throughout the school year, which we will communicate to mentees and mentors via email and through the Facebook group and other community um, group that we end up setting up. And next slide, please. So here are some helpful links, including uh, to the existing Facebook group and the iSchool's Student Life and Experience webpage that I keep mentioning, and our email is mentoring.ischool at gmail.com. So that's it for me, um, but I'm here to answer any questions you have at the end of this presentation. And again, you're welcome to the iSchool. All the best to you all. Hello. <laughs> Oh, that's Mel. Hi, Mel. <laughs> it's Melanie Coleman. Thank you all. And we're really excited for this year. So um, stay tuned. Yeah. And we're here to answer questions at the end. Perfect. Thank you all so much. Very helpful. Okay. Oops. Here we go. All right. 
so before I do open it up to you um, for questions, I just want to go through some of the other events that we're going to be having um, over the next two weeks. Um, so if you would like to uh, get to know some of our students a little bit better, um, next week, July 13th, we're going to have a session with our Master of Information Student Council, um, as well as our part-time student uh, working group, who are also part of the uh, NISC uh, Student Council. So full-time, part-time students, uh, Master of Information students, please attend that event if you want to um, learn more about um, Student Council, how to get involved, other resources, and just to chat a little bit more with some of our other students as well. Um, for Masters of Museum Studies, that's July 15th, um, as well as the Museum Professionals of Color um, will both um, be there, uh, representatives from both um, councils and groups will, will be there that you can chat with um, as well. The following week, July 19th to 23rd, um, we'll have individual um, advising sessions with your faculty liaisons. So every one of our concentrations and programs um, have either a program director or a faculty liaison. Um, they are going to be hosting hour long um, uh, enrollment and advising sessions as well. And they're going to go through things like uh, a little bit more about course requirements, um, how to select courses, um, some electives that you might want to consider that complement that concentration or program very well, and a lot more and answer any of your other questions through there as well. Um, so the dates are there. Um, you should have received the link to register for these events already through the new student newsletter. Hopefully you are reading my newsletters. Um, the information on how to register again will be found um, in that newsletter. So please attend as many events as you would like. Um, there's no limit. Um, you can attend all if you want, um, but they are available for you to attend um, over the next two weeks. And then save the date. Starting August 23rd to September 10th, we are going to have a new student orientation. Um, the sessions are still being finalized. We hope to have those um, dates finalized for you at the beginning of August. Um, so again, please keep an eye out um, in your new student newsletter for how to register for those events. But we will have um, a lot of other events to help get you started for the start of classes, which will be September 13th. Um, so, um, we're going to have some specific sessions for, um, you know, combined degree program students, um, international students, part-time students, um, workshops on academic success, um, accessibility services, wellness sessions, um, other social events planned by your student councils. Um, SGS, Students of Grad, uh, School of Graduate Studies, will host orientation sessions as well that you can attend. Um, as well as the Center for International Experience. So again, just look out for your um, for more information in the new student newsletter. All right, so that is it for the formal part of the presentation. Now um, I open it up to you. And um, again, uh, Nicole and I will be taking those questions and we will uh, present them to our speakers. So feel free to write them in the chat to Nicole um, and I, and we will um, take turns, um, we'll alternate. Um, who answers the question um, or who asks the question for our speakers. Um, so Nicole, I'm not sure if you have a bunch of questions have, that have popped up, but you can start if you would like. Yeah, um, I had a couple. There was one in particular that was asking about the difference between lectures and practicals and tutorials, if someone could elaborate more on that. Sure. Um, lectures is, think of it as the traditional classroom setting. You have to instructors standing in the front or in front of the screen, um, and you're taking in uh, knowledge, content, um, the topics that you sign up for with the course, basically. Tutorials are often way smaller groups. So if a lecture is about 50 to 70 students, a tutorial could go as small as just 10 to 15 students only or 25, depending on the course, right? Uh, it allows you to interact uh, with your classmates. It allows you to interact with instructors or the TA, depending on the course. Um, so it allows for a lot more closer one-on-one -on -one en uh, groups engagement um, in, in, in the classroom setting. Um, 
uh, practicals, uh, we don't see it too often. It is more common for our UXD user design and experience concentration students or our um, human-centered data science students. Uh, practicals probably might involve you um, coming onto campus using one of the studios that we have, designing something uh, more hands-on pieces. Um, that's kind of what we categorize for practicals. That's my spiel. Anyone else would like to add? <laughs> oh, I thought that was great. Um, another question, how does the fee balance remainder work for those registered with accessibility service um, who are taking reduced course load but are still considered a full time? So you could go on a reduced course load as a full-time student under accessibility services, that's A-OK. -okay. Um, if you want to maintain your full-time status, um, you can, you, it's fine. Uh, you can go as low as two courses, or if you want to take three courses. Um, and typically what our students do is to make use of the summer term where no additional tuition fees will be charged to pick up the remaining courses that they would have liked to complete if they would have taken a full course load. So for our students with accessibility challenges that have to go on a reduced course load, if they wish to maintain full-time status, they would have still completed the degree requirements uh, within four terms of full-time tuition fees, basically. However, if you anticipate that uh, you will need to go on a further reduced load and take perhaps take a longer time to complete than just two years, uh, we do recommend to switch into part time status so that it reduces each term's tuition fees um, and allow you a longer time and flexibility to complete your degree requirements. And then you pay in the balance of degree fee pad prior to graduation. So that is a possibility as well. Um, you will still be paying the same minimum degree fee. Sounds great. Um, someone here also had a question. Um, what's the main difference between the talent internships and the work study opportunities that are available at iSchool? Oh, hours difference and um, the location difference. Uh, I think our libraries do participate in the talent internship piece more uh, than work studies. Uh, work study could be anywhere on campus. Our office itself, the student services team, we hire uh, a number of uh, work study students. It's not specifically related to the library, uh, the libraries um, of the university. It's more admin work. It could be related to records. Um, if you're going to be working Working, if you're a work study student working with Andrea, you'll be doing more admissions, recruitment, social media pieces. Um, so the, the type of work that you'll be doing will probably be different and hours, the number of hours that you'll be working will be different as well. Uh, work study students do work a maximum of 200 hours in total for the fall and winter. Uh, talent probably follow slightly different hours. Um, they might, they probably do have more hours as well. Um, what? Uh, does a special topic specified course mean? Oh, sorry, Andrea, could you repeat that? Oh, uh, what does a special topics specified course mean? Oh, um, it's a, mm, in practical terms, um, it's a course that we, it's a new course basically that we created based on interest that we have seen among students, based on demand in the industry that we have seen. It's basically a new course. It's not a regular, it's not a regular course that we offer year to year to year. So if you actually do see a special topics course with a topic that you are very interested in taking, you might want to take it in your first year as opposed to waiting to see if it's going to be offered in your second year, because it may not be offered in the second year. Sounds good. Of course. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm just viewing here a couple of questions. 
Um, if someone is coming from the I school and they did their undergraduate at the University of Toronto, um, are they allowed to keep their UTORID and student number that they had during undergrad for their graduate studies? You have to actually, you don't get to get a new set of identity. <laughs> um, you keep your UTOR ID, you keep your UToronto email address, you keep your student number. Your transcript, once you have completed your MI or MMSD graduate degree, um, it will all be in one big long transcript. So yes, please continue being that student. <laughs> we cannot create another identity. Sorry, I'm just trying to answer questions as I go along as well. Um, uh, so if someone chooses to pursue the thesis stream, um, does that put them in a different category to qualify for a stipend? Mm, no, it's still a professional degree. Thesis is just, we see it more, thesis we see it more as an elective that students are are taking per se to, to pursue and to finish up their MI degree requirements. So going the thesis stream doesn't make you a research-based student um, in the U University of Toronto sense. You're still in a professional degree, uh, but it's just that you're choosing to complete a thesis um, as opposed to uh, completing just regular coursework or completing a co-op. Um, for students that are on, on this call that are interested in a thesis stream um, uh, or a thesis as an elective to complete your MI, MMST degree, uh, just one uh, reminder, thesis itself is actually weighed 2.0 credits. Uh, as mentioned as mentioned earlier, MI students complete eight credits, uh, MMST students complete 7.5. Um, so just bear in mind that 2.0 is actually pretty big in the grand scheme of things. So it does cut into um, the electives that you're eligible to take. Okay, so do plan accordingly. Sorry, I'm also just looking here as well. For students that are joining the co-op program, for example, um, if they want to maintain full-time status, would they have to take three classes during the fall while working? How does that work? Please don't take three courses while you're working full-time. Um, so you do maintain your full-time status while you're away on co-op, uh, but you don't have to take um, three courses to maintain that full-time status. Typically what we see with our co-op students is you will be enrolled in co-op. So it is it, it gets presented as a co-op course on your transcript. Um, and if their work schedule allows for it, they might take an elective or a course while they are on co-op. And that is the extent of the courses that they will take. So for students that are thinking about two terms of co-op, the typical time frame in which you are going to be doing co-op will probably be the summer after completion of year one, year one summer, you go on co-op and then fall semester, you go on co-op and you come back winter term to round up degree requirements. And you also have the summer after year two fall and winter um, to round up degree requirements as well. Um, each co-op course. So if you were to go up for a co-op and you're enrolled in the co-op course, it is equivalent to 0 0.5 credit. So the co-op term itself is not just you working. You actually do have to be enrolled into our co-op course. And the completion of the co-op course itself is, at, is weighed at 0 0.5 credit. So that helps to contribute and helps you to complete your degree requirements as well. Um, it's not just that you'll be working full time. So there are, sorry, a lot of questions about um, uh, applying for work safe positions. So I'm just going to mm -hmm. quickly touch on that. Um, the work safe positions do become available August 16th to apply to, and they'll be available to apply for uh, through the CLN um, website. And you will be notified in the new student newsletter when uh, positions do open, and you can apply with a link on how to, to access uh, the postings. Um, and then there was uh, some questions about can you do work say in co op? Um, you can, just not at the same time. Um, so you can do like a fall winter in your first year work study, 
um, and then do a co-op in the summer next fall, but not do work city at the same time as the co-op. Um, yeah. And um, someone raised a good important question in terms of mental health. Um, as mm -hmm. high school students, where do we go for, um, are we able to go to the St. George Health and Wellness Center for mental health resources? Or is there something more specific? It really depends on which route the student will prefer to go. Um, by all means, the health and wellness team on, on the St. George campus is more than happy to, um, to have the students come directly to them. Um, or if you prefer for us to put a referral in for you uh, to get one-on-one support and counseling services, we can do that. Um, there is also a 24-7 online counseling service that is available to all U of T students called MySSP. Um, uh, I typically like to recommend students um, to do both. So both have, have my SSP in your back pocket, have it in your inbox. It's a app that you can download onto your phone and you can text a counselor 24 seven if you will like that route, uh, but also receive help one-on-one -on -one with a health and wellness counseling counselor team member so that you are able to get that one-on-one -on -one engagement, that one-on-one -on -one case management, as someone that is able to follow you through your journey one-on-one -on -one when you are a registered student. Um, so I typically like to provide our students with both of these resources in your back pocket. Um, uh, but by all means, if you if you feel more comfortable going to uh, going to health and wellness yourself, by all means, um, or you can come to one of the student services team member, one of the academic advisors, uh, Christine uh, that you have met, myself or Lindsay, um, our other MI MMSD advisor, um, any of one of us could help to put in a referral uh, for you to access one of the members of the health and wellness team. During the regular fall and winter semester, we do have a dedicated uh, member on the health and wellness team that meet with all uh, high school students. Um, uh, so um, if when we put in that one-on-one -on -one referral is directed to that health and wellness team member, her name is Tracy Doyle, um, during the summer, um, during the summer, she is not available. So during the summer, we will just refer our students to one um, available member of the health and wellness team. Yeah. Oops. Um, can we do two concentrations and a term of co-op or will we not have enough credits to do that? Uh, Sherry did mention something about not recommending two concentrations is you would not have time uh, for more. And the same thing with the thesis. <laughs> yeah, co-op and thesis are mutually exclusive. Pick one, go with it. Um, for our thesis students that is very much interested to still get that work experience or the hands-on experience, um, then I recommend that you think about practicum. It's something that we haven't quite mentioned yet, so I'll briefly talk about it here. Um, for our MI students, we offer co-op. We also offer practicum. Co-op is your standard full-time, probably Monday to Friday, nine to five kind of a role. You will that will that will be your attention for the semester. You know, you'll be working with a team of people. You're working with a organization. It's, uh, typically, paid work. Um, for practicum, it's slightly different. Practicum is project-based as opposed to work-based. So practicum is very much seen as a course per se. There's some coursework involved, but you will be working with a uh, you will be working with an organization, but you'll be working on a specific project that the organization needs help with. Um, it could be a 45 hour project for the term, or it could be a 105 hour project for the term. We try to offer practicum um, every single semester. Uh, but for instance, last year, because of COVID, we weren't able to offer practicum for one of the terms, but it's something that is typically offered every single semester. 
So for students that are very much interested in thesis and know that thesis is the way to go, you want to do that, but you kind of don't want to lose out on that hands-on practical experience, you can go for the practicum route. You wouldn't be able to go for the co-op route just because you won't have enough space on your, in your eight credits uh, to do both. Okay, and likewise for our co-op students, uh, if you're, you know, for sure, I want to do co-op, I want to go for two terms of co-op, nothing less. Uh, if you're uh, someone like that, then I recommend you think about uh, a reading course, perhaps, uh, to kind of get your feet wet in terms of research, that is a possibility. Reading course, think of it as a 0 0.5 credit uh, independent research project that you'll be working one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member. Uh, as I previously mentioned, thesis is a 2.0 giant project that you'll be working one-on-one -on -one with a committee, right? A reading course is a much smaller version. It's a 0 0.5 credit elective that any student is eligible to take as long as you're able to find a faculty member to take you on one-on-one. -on -one. So it, it is suitable for students that are doing co-op because it could be just an elective that you take on the side. Perfect. And just going back to what you mentioned about mental health, um, someone was asking about the one-on-one -on -one mental health support that um, yeah. you provide. Is it, off the, is it offered directly out of the iSchool or is it an off-campus counselor? So our mental health and mental health and wellness uh, team on St. George campus is still working out how they will be delivering um, their services in the fall semester. Uh, in a pre-COVID times, it's like pre-COVID times, pre-COVID times, they do have an office, specific office in our building, in the Bissell building on the sixth floor. So it's super accessible for our students. They just hop onto the sixth floor for their appointment, uh, if and whenever. Um, during COVID days, obviously, all the appointments transition to online. Um, so there is that. So for the fall semester, um, given that um, most staff members probably will be returning to on campus slowly, little bit by little bit, um, maybe their appointments will be a combination between in-person and virtual um, as allowed. Um, so there is that. But typically, it is an in-person kind of a setting. Yeah. Okay, sorry, someone just asked about um, the CDP and co-op and internships. Um, so you can, you're not eligible to do the co-op as a CDP student just because it's not feasible for you to be able to complete the requirements for two work terms outside of the university, as well as the requirements for the CDP option because it is quite intense, um, the program. However, that being said, there are already work integrated learning opportunities built into the program. So through the, um, M the MMSC internship, um, the exhibition project, um, and you can also enroll in a practicum course on the MI side as well. Um, so don't worry, you're still getting that work integrated learning opportunities um, built into the program, just not necessarily through the co-op option. Yeah, and just adding on to that, um, someone else asked something a little bit similar about, I guess, like the main significance of doing the thesis research compared to gaining work experience through co-op. Where would you like to head, head to? <laughs> it really depends on um, maybe the students uh, that the students on the call on the meeting could chat a little bit more about their thoughts and experience and perspective. Um, to me as an academic advisor and just going back to my own experience as a student many, 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 many moons ago, but as a student, um, it really depends on where you would like to be headed. Uh, some students come into their master's program gunning for a doctoral program uh, down the line, if that's the case. Uh, thesis, um, thesis is not required for a doctoral application, but it's much looked for because all doctoral programs are research-based. So one of the things that you will absolutely need to highlight in any doctoral application is your research competencies. Um, and a the thesis demonstrates that, right? So, um, but not to say that if you're, go if you're wanting to go for doctoral studies and you don't take thesis, am I completely out of luck? 
No, not necessarily, right? There's other ways that you can look at in illustrating your research competencies. It could be through a reading course. It could be through working as a research assistant, uh, various projects you can do. Maybe your co-op is in the research and development department of uh, somewhere, right? Um, Students going for a co-op, they are, um, you know, they, they really just want to get the grad degree um, and to be working in a, in, a, in a professional capacity the moment they graduate. Um, so it's hard to say. Uh, it's one is not valued more than the other. Uh, they bring in different experiences. They build different kinds of competencies, um, and we have left the MI and the MST degree kind of and CDP degree kind of flexible enough uh, for students to kind of choose, choose the path they want to follow. It's kind of build your own, right? Not sure if the students on the call will like to uh, jump in with their perspective. Um, somebody here asked about dropping a concentration. You can do that um, at any time through your ACORN account. Um, so just log into ACORN and you can add, remove, change concentrations anytime. So if you do decide, if you are in two concentrations right now and you do decide you want to just um, complete one concentration, you do actually have to go and drop that on ACORN. You can't just not, um, you can't just leave it. Um, so just make sure you go into ACORN and you, you actually drop the concentration. Mm -hmm. And we had a question specifically from an international student. We're wondering how early they should arrive on campus. Um, if there's any updates on quarantining. She was told she was supposed to arrive about three to four weeks before classes. Um, I'm not sure if there's any additional information on that, on arriving on campus for international students. Um, I think keep an eye for all international students uh, that are coming in for September to keep your eye on the quarantine page on the Vice Provost Office website. Um, Josh, if you could include a link in the chat here for all the students. Um, uh, it'll be good to keep an eye on that. And just because uh, quarantine regulations have been changing pretty frequently, uh, you know, given the vaccine rates in Canada, um, given um, the university is also trying to work closely with Health Canada to see if uh, to change certain steps of the quarantine so that our international students is just quarantining in one spot as opposed to, I think currently there is a two stage, you quarantine first in one hotel and then you go somewhere else after. Um, so the university is also regularly working with Health Canada um to see if there's changes and we, if we can make the process smoother for our international students coming in um currently i think the last that we have heard in the beginning of july is uh, for students that are coming in with two shots of the vaccines under one of the uh, uh, under one of the, I think the Pfizer or the Moderna or the AstraZeneca Johnson and Johnson then there's actually no need for quarantine although you do still have to create a quarantine plan prior to arrival um, and by July I think the next update for our international students about quarantine regulations should be coming in July 21st um, so do check back on that and see if there's any other updates otherwise I believe the quarantine period remains as two weeks um, so our first class uh, the start of the class um, First day of classes in the fall term starts September 13th. Uh, so we do encourage students to arrive prior to, to the end of August uh, to meet that two weeks deadline um, so that you can start uh, fresh with us in fall term, September 13th. And I see there that Josh is providing lots of useful links. <laughs> yes, um, just as a follow up, someone was asking because um, there are delayed visas that international students are facing. Um, mm -hmm. Would there be any relaxations for them if they arrive later than September 13th? Relaxation in terms, uh, not quite. I mean, classes will still start as per usual September 13th. We're not delaying the start 
date of classes. So that's, that is going to start as per usual. Um, you might be able to ask, access uh, a lot of the lecture materials online. Like I've mentioned, um, a lot of the lectures will have, a lot of the, a lot of the big lectures will be happening online because it's not quite possible to find um, a, a space that is big enough for every course with enough social distancing requirement. Um, so you might be able to start the classes online, um, but the in-person components are going to start pretty rapidly in the tutorials and the practicals. Um, so if you, if you are becoming aware that your study permit is going to come through really late in September or even in October, um, then please come and chat with us. You can email the admissions.ischool at uToronto.ca uh, to let us know that th there is this issue with your study permit. Um, and then we need to start taking a look at if you should be deferring your admissions to a later year um, or um, if you think you'll be able to catch up to the missed lecture materials or the in-person components, how that experience is going to look like when you actually do arrive. Um, so we can have a discussion there and help you to make an informed decision. If you have more questions, Nicole, you can, I'm just answering the ones that have come in on my side. So if you have more questions, you can go ahead. <laughs> All right, um, sounds good. Let me just double check here. All right, um, someone was asking if you could just go through the application process of um, the MI co-op programs, if there's any dates to consider and if there's any differences for um, part-time and full-time students. Oh, uh, co-op is something that is available to full-time students only. Um, for part-time students that are interested in co-op, um, it doesn't quite make sense for you to go to co-op just because you will need to switch to full-time status. And in terms of tuition fees, it doesn't quite make financial sense. Uh, so co-op is something that is only available to our full-time student. Um, and I do believe our careers team slash co-op team uh, is going to be having a session with all the incoming students to kind of give you guys the lowdown on what to expect. Um, the general timeline, barring any changes that the careers team might uh, might have for the fall semester, a uh, fall term is very much um, do make sure you are in INF 3900 in the fall semester is the co-op preparatory course, um, a kind of the prerequisite to the co-op piece. Um, so in the fall semester, make sure you're enrolled in that. For students that are coming into a program with extensive or substantial uh, professional experience already, you may not need to take INF 3900. There is an individualized career preparatory pathway that you could follow instead, which requires you to book an appointment one-on-one -on -one with one of our careers advisors um, to determine if there is any workshops um, across campus that we will like you to take to kind of supplement that co-op preparatory experience. So fall term, uh, enroll into your full course load, four courses, winter term, enroll into your, um, into, enroll into full course load, enroll into your required courses. Um, Co-op does require you to complete the year one required courses of your concentration, be full time um, in your regular full course load. Um, I think uh, the minimum GPA, re CGPA requirement for the fall term, um, last, uh, last year we had the requirement at 3.75 due to COVID implications. Uh, the regular requirement is 3.85. Um, I'm not too sure, you kind of have to wait for the careers team on whether or not what is the academic requirement for fall semester for students to be eligible for co-op. Um, Thank you, Josh. Um, 
And then it's a uh, chuck along fall term, do ball in them. Um, and uh, we wait for the fall term results to be released. Um, we do our calculations, we check whether or not students have completed required courses. And the careers team typically uh, let students know around end of January, early February, whether or not they're eligible for two terms of co-op or is it just one term of co-op, et cetera. So that's kind of the time frame. Um, typically, what the co-op team does, does in the fall term around October-ish, they will send out an email to all our MI students for them to indicate to them uh, whether or not they're interested in co-op. So they get, you get put on kind of like a regular um, mailing list distribution. Um, to keep tabs on um, co-op eligibility or careers team activities um, that they will like co-op students to have eyeballs on. So that's kind of the time frame, general time frame. More details to come from the careers team. Sounds great. Um, there are a couple of questions here about for students that are interested in doing the PhD stream in the future, um, which mm -hmm. would be better would you say a practicum or a thesis? Ah, so hard. For students that are very, very much interested in doctoral studies, I do recommend the thesis pathway, just so that you have really extensive um, research experience, you'll be working with a supervisor, second reader, you will see, you will go through a whole experience with a thesis supervisory committee. Um, I think there will be good insight for um, and it will be it'd be very good insight and experience um, for students to have that really wants to go the doctoral route um, or wants to apply to a doctoral program, be it with iSchool, be it with another program. Yeah, I think that'll be a really good experience to have. It's not compulsory. I have to go back to that. My caveat is the thesis is not compulsory uh, for students wanting to apply to doctoral studies. It's just really good to have. Sounds good. And um, Son was also wondering, I guess, what day next week will the timetables be available? Um, and then someone else asked a little bit about in terms of the course loads, um, if there's like a course recommended timetable, which um, it depends on your program of study. So I'll link that below. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Um, uh, we are hoping to get it published uh, Tuesday, Wednesday. So if you look, you can keep an eye. So if you Google timetable, iSchool, Utrono, um, or Joshua Nicole could provide that in our chat. Um, it's, it's just one page where we put all our course delivery and course offering information. So just keep an eye on that. In terms of a sample timetable, we will actually be doing you a disservice by providing a sample timetable, just, just a, given the variety of interests and pathways and electives um, that our students wanting to take. The, tr the three general steps that I do recommend students doing when, you know, once the course offering schedule is available for, for the fall and winter, plot in your your year one require courses first plot that in because you have to take it you can run away from it but just do it so plot that in first choose the sections without conflict okay and then thinking more deeply into what your interests are uh what are the competencies that you want to kind of gain out of this degree why you're pursuing this degree in the first place will probably be a very good guiding question in helping you to choose electives talk to upper year students, Andrea, uh, Hadis, Ma Melanie, they are great, great, your upper year peers are great, great resources um, in getting to know the electives, what professors are like, you know, if there are certain professors that you absolutely need to be taking courses with. Um, so next we'll be plotting in the electives, right? So that will be a good three-step process on how to kind of create your year one timetable. Uh, MISC, uh, the MI Student Council, MUSA, the, MI, the MMST um, Student Council, our peer mentorship program, um, all of these are great resources in having a chat and finding out what kind of electives to take. Uh, last but not least, I need to have a special mention for all our concentration liaisons and program directors. 
uh, program directors and concentration liaisons are faculty members that are experts in their fields. Uh, for MI students, you know, if you are a UXC student, if you are a human-centered data student, if you're a library and information studies student, they're probably, even if super vague, okay, even, super, even if super vague, we have read all of your application statements. You're coming in with a certain direction that you would like to be headed towards, right? So have a chat, book an appointment, email our concentration liaisons to talk about why you're doing this degree and get their expert advice on, hey, what are some of the electives that you really should be thinking about and taking to kind of get you to where you want to go after the degree, right? So, um, have these conversations, have these engagements. Um, students are not just choosing electives out of a vacuum. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much for all the information. Um, we have a couple of questions in terms of financial matters. Someone was asking if um, OSAP doesn't cover the tuition for the whole fall term. What are the other alternative options available before um, paying on August 23rd? So for all students that are receiving OSAP, um, so how all of these government student loan programs go is you punch in all your financial information, right? Um, hopefully students on the call have done an OSAP application before. So you punch in all your you know, financial information um, and they will assess you for a certain financial need. So let's say it's here. So they, what OSAP eventually ends up giving you may not be actually here. It might actually be here, right? So a little bit less than what your total financial need as assessed by OSEP and various loan programs are. So there is a bit of a portion of unmet financial need. And that information is received centrally by our office from the central OSEP office that we have on campus. And what we will do in late October, early November, we'll take a look at every student's uh, that are receiving OSAP, all of their unmet financial need, and provide a portion of assistance, a portion, we cannot cover your entire unmet financial need, I'll be clear with that, um, but we'll help with a portion of your unmet financial need automatically considered through the PMFA, the Professional Master's Financial Assistance. Uh, for students that are receiving out-of-province loans, please go to our website um, and complete the small application that is linked on there as we will not receive your out-of-province loan information centrally. And we will also consider you for the PMFA. So that will be assistance coming in from the faculty. Um, other than that, other uh, ways of funding, obviously, is you, you are receiving an award or a scholarship. Um, outside of that, you will be dipping into your savings. You'll be dipping into um, a line of credit potentially, um, and or any part-time work, work-study program, the work-study program, part-time work on campus or off campus uh, will help to supplement uh, tuition and living expenses. There are um, a bunch of questions here that I'm just gonna answer um, about when your, um, when the invoice is gonna be available on ACORN. Um, so the School of Graduate Studies, I believe they're looking to hopefully post those invoices by July 19th um, and there are a few questions about the payment for it so you don't have to pay for the full year so for, by August 27th which is the recommended payment date you just have to pay your fall uh, tuition fees um, by that date and then your winter in the winter um, but the, the invoice yes will be available the end of July probably around July 19th on your acorn account um, and you can have a look um, there to see what that a minimum amount or minimum payment will be then. Um, and then there's another question here, probably um, maybe our students can jump in here, um, but I'm a bit worried as I have been out of school for years and there are non, um, are there non-traditional students or older students? Um, and is there some sort of community to connect with? I'll start off by saying is you're definitely not the only one. Um, we have a very good mix of students who come directly from an undergraduate degree, as well as students who've been out of school for 5, 10, 20, 30 years, as well as students who also hold a master's degree already and a PhD degree. Um, so you're not alone, um, but I'm not sure if the students want to jump in with that as well. Yeah, um, so Mel is uh, also turned on her camera, so the 
yeah, definitely. Well, I'll speak for myself first. Um, I've been working for a while. I do have a, a master of science degree already from U of T and I've come back to, um, to U of T, to the high school a couple of years ago to, to do a master of information. So uh, yes, and I'll, I'll let Mel <laughs> share her story. Are you muted, Mel? Thanks, Andrea. Um... Yeah, just briefly, I work at the University of Toronto at uh, the Downtown Central Career Services as an employer recruitment and engagement coordinator. And I've been at the University of Toronto since 2012 and a, a employer liaison since 2016. So I'm very familiar with CLNX, the Career and Co-Curricular Learning Network. So if you have questions about work study, um, finding jobs, navigating the CLNX, please let me know. Feel free to, to email me or, you know, consider joining the mentoring, uh, the peer mentoring program as a mentee or as a mentor, um, because we have a lot of information to share. And um, I'm on my fifth credit. I'm taking the practicum course this summer. And um, so I, you know, we can certainly answer questions about that. Um, and uh, I mean, bottom line, we're just, I'm very grateful to be here. I am a, a part-time student. Um, my graduate or my undergrad, I graduated from the University of Toronto in 1990. So I've been here for a while and uh, English and fine arts studio minor and uh, just very grateful to be at the, the iSchool studying UXD. Yeah, and for me, I started as a full-time student in uh, 2019, uh, and then when uh, um, we were in lockdown because of COVID, um, that following year, I decided to, to switch to part-time. And um, yeah, so we have lots, lots of information to share also on time management, um, for example, and um, great, lots of people here to share information, so just reach out. And if I could just add to, this is Melena Bernstein from the Learning Hub. I think what's something that's so special about the Faculty of Information and the, the work that you're all doing is that it's not something that is, is um, outside of the realm of all of your professional expertise that you've built up. And one of the things that I hope that the Learning Hub can do is really help you understand the range of ways in which your lived experience and your professional experience are things that can be leveraged for all of the learning you're gonna do in the classroom, which of course will then be leveraged again for all of your good professional work out in the world. Um, and so I hope you don't see that as a deficiency in any way. I hope you recognize all of the ways in which your lived experience are things that can be used in the classroom. And it's something that we're hoping that the Learning Hub can really help you sort of um, to make explicit for you and to, and to help you leverage all of that good expertise and knowledge. That was great. Um, thank you all for sharing your experiences. Um, I don't have any questions right now, but feel free uh, if anyone else has any other questions to message me or Andrea. Um, um, one just came in, um, are full-time students eligible to be enrolled in a health insurance plan? Um, I can answer that if anyone else, unless anyone else wants to. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, so I, um, that would more information can be found on um, the Graduate Students Union web website, I believe. Let me see if yeah. I can get the link. Or if Joshua, you have the link, if you can post it in the chat. Yeah. So actually, all our students pay into uh, the Graduate Student Health Benefits Plan, Health and Dental. Um, uh, for if you have another health insurance plan for our part-time students, for example, you may be working full-time for a company that already has an existing health insurance plan and you don't need the graduate student health and then uh, health and dental benefits plan. Um, there's a period on, in which you can opt out of it um, and recoup uh, some of the campus fees that I was talking about. 
Um, so you could do that. But otherwise, all our full-time and part-time students, it's part of your tuition fees. It's the part of the campus fees uh, that I was talking about. Uh, you, you pay into that. Sounds good. Um, we have a couple of questions now that just came in in regards to money matters. Um, first on the international side, someone was asking, um, what is like the preferred mode of payment for um, the remainder of the international students fee? Will they have to pay through Western Union? Are there other alternatives? Um, if you're not in Canada, and if you don't have a Canadian bank account, uh, the way to pay will be through the Western Union Global Pay or through a credit card. Um, once you're here, um, you probably would want to look into uh, you probably would want to look into creating a Canadian bank account. And once that is created, then you can easily pay as like a bill payment for your tuition through your bank, online bank. So there isn't a preferred method per se. It's more of um, what, is the, what is the way for you to pay depending on where you are, depending on whether or not you have a Canadian bank account, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and of course, it's, it's probably a lot easier uh, for you to just create a Canadian bank account when you're here and then just pay as a pay tuition as a bill payment or if you have TD travel points. Yeah, those are all great options. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so we just had one again from domestic students. If you take a loan from OSAP and a line of credit, um, how do you directly pay for your tuition and do you have to use your student number in any part of the process? So OSAP, um, um, I think students can choose to direct the OSAP funding to yourself or to the university. Uh, most of our students choose for the funds to be directed to the university. So we, what we often see is uh, students defer their tuition online and then um, the OSAP funding will come through in time. Um, and so we see it being deducted from the ACORN. Um, so there is that, but if you direct the OSEP funds to yourself, so it has to be directed obviously to a Canadian bank account, um, and then you'll be paying the university and just like, a, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, if you have the OSEP funding going to yourself, um, then you will just make a bill payment instead. For a line of credits, the line of credit is between you and the bank. So if you're accessing funds from your line of credit, um, then obviously you have to um, follow whatever the process your bank have in terms of you accessing the line of credit funds um, and you do it as a bill payment to the university. So line of credit funds don't come to the university directly. It's a relationship between you and your bank only. Sounds great. Um, just more questions on money matters as well. Someone was asking, when is first semester tuition due? The recommended date to pay is August 27th so that the university can process and uh, process your payment by September 10th. Um, if the payment is not processed by September 10th, then students do run the risk of losing their enrolled courses because it's kind of a, your pay, whether or not you're paying your tuition fees is a signal to the university on whether or not you're actually intending to arrive or take courses. Um, enrolling into courses is one thing, but paying your tuition fees is the final signal to the university that you do intend to come. So August 27th, recommended date to pay your fall term tuition or to defer your tuition Let's fees see. online so that the university can receive and process your payment by September 10th. Great, I have a bunch of questions just about the recording. Yes, um, again, we will be sharing the recording with everybody through the Graduate Admissions Hub. Um, and also be, um, a link will be posted in the new student newsletter as well. So if you did miss anything, please make sure you are looking out for that. Under the Graduate Admissions Hub, you'll be find, you can find it under the Getting Started tab under Modules. Um, and the recording as well as the Getting Started Guide will be found there as well. Um, it is 12 o'clock, so hopefully we have answered all the questions. Um, I believe I answered all the questions on my end, um, but I'd like to thank you all again very much for attending today's session.
um, and to Sherry and to Melina and to Daisy and to the peer mentors and to everybody who, who came out to uh, speak with you today as well. Thank you so very much and Nicole and Joshua and everybody who helped on, on the, the back end and tech side of things. Um, but we're again, very excited to have you here. Um, and if, again, please make sure you are um, looking out for your, um, the recordings and other resources to help you with um, enrollment and also attend the enrollment events that are coming up within the next two weeks for more information um, about everything to do with uh, course in, um, enrollment and advising and things like that. Um, so yes, I hope you have a great rest of the day, evening, afternoon, um, wherever, whatever time zone you're coming from. Um, and, and that's it for us. Thanks for joining us today, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.